Good morning, Church of the Crossing. My name is Jim, and I live up the road of I-69 in a little burg called Anderson, Indiana. And for some of you who are familiar with the history of this particular congregation, and maybe some of my own history, for I've met many of you before, Anderson is the seat of what's called the Church of God. And this congregation is one of over 2,000 congregations of the Church of God in the United States and Canada. And my wife and I moved from Seattle some years ago to Anderson to become the pastor of a local church there. And then I was asked to step up into what's called the position of general director at Church of God Ministries, which is the office of that general assembly. And so I can speak with some credibility when I say to you today, on behalf of your over 2,000 brothers and sisters in congregations, well, it's a quarter million in those 2,000 congregations in the United States, and in four times as many more, in 90 other countries working simultaneously in 23 time zones for Jesus. I bring you greetings. And also bring you thanks for this particular community of faith at the Church of the Crossing for your years of faithful, biblically grounded, and Jesus honoring witness. No small thing. And whatever brought you here today, perhaps you are seeking God for yourself in a personal circumstance. Maybe you're here because it's your custom or your history or your legacy, or maybe you're here today because your mother made you come, or maybe you came just out of curiosity. Whatever brought you here, know. You need to know that in this room, in this place, in this community of faith, there is influence and there is life found not just here, but far beyond what you can ask or imagine. Because around the world, people know about this congregation and look to it for its own integrity. Thank you for being that people. As I said, my wife and I moved from Seattle some years ago to Central Indiana. It seemed like quite a foreign mission tour at the time because it was very different then. And well, everything is different now, but I just want you to know that since we moved to Anderson, so much of Seattle has come right into your own neighborhood at Keystone of the Crossing. I mean, there's a Nordstrom store. That's a Seattle deal. There's a Seas Candy store. I grew up with that. There's a Starbucks. Welcome home. There's a Costco down at Castleton. I feel like if you could just get Mount Rainier here, I would absolutely never have to think about Seattle again. I won't try and bore you with stories of Seattle. I'm just to say, I feel at home here. But not just because of the stores across the highway, but because of the spirit that is in this place. And I'm so honored and privileged to be invited to speak into the new series of teaching that began last week here at Church of the Crossing, Demystifying Revelation. One of the most mysterious and talked about books of all time. Certainly for the last 20 centuries, people have wrestled from every end of the theological spectrum and experience about the meaning of what is so often described mysteriously as revelation. The book Revelation is mysterious in a way. It is a revealing book. And how you understand it and how you interpret it can have profound impacts on your own personal journey and the journey of those around you. In fact, it's the only book of all 66 in the Holy Writ from Genesis to Revelation that ends with a promise that if you read and study this, you will be blessed. I've been invited to speak about the truth revealed in the book of Revelation in the first uh, section, chapters one, two, and three, but today particularly chapters two and three. And as we dive in, I just again want to thank you for coming and for the church's staff for inviting me. But as we look at the book of Revelation, you need to know in chapters two and three, it's a series of messages to seven churches and seven cities. And as a kind of moniker, think of it this way. Every church has a story. Every church has a context, a challenge, and a promise. And the Apostle John, the only one of the original 12 that died by natural cause, so far as we can tell, in his advanced old age, likely in his 90s, he was exiled in persecution for his faith in Jesus to an island off what we would now call modern day Turkey, called Patmos. And while he was there, he writes in the opening chapter of the book of Revelation, his journey, that while he was in prayer on the Lord's day, that's the first day of the week, the day why we're gathered here now, it's the resurrection day of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I had a vision. He fell into a kind of a supernatural, mysterious trance. And he used these words, I saw heaven open. And when he saw heaven open, he saw the Jesus that he had followed in the flesh, that Jesus who had held his hand, with whom he had sat to dine, that Jesus who had heard the sound of his 
material voice, that Jesus who saw him eye to eye, that Jesus who he watched and learned from for those spectacular three years of his journey that set the course of the whole rest of his life. He saw that same Jesus, but in a way more glorious because Jesus, the son of man that John worked with, walked with first, was flesh and blood in the same way as he, but now Jesus in the resurrected body, still recognizable, still in the same form, and yet now the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, this majestic God, the very creator of the universe in human form, that Jesus appears to him when he sees heaven open. And in that, he says to John, I want you to write these things down. I've got a word for you. I have some revelation to give you for my people. And I believe, as so many others have, that it was not just for that contemporaneous group, that original audience of the first century, but it was for all people who are seeking truth and seeking God. It's a revelation for all the centuries until the Lord himself returns. And in that, he said, I want you to write to seven churches. These seven all have a story, and there's specific messages in these chapters two and three. They're specifically written into the context the challenge and the promise of each unique community of faith, all unique but united and in common pursuit of Jesus. So as we look at the next slide, you'll see a map. This is modern day Turkey. These churches were all in what was in the Roman age, the first century of the Christian era, called Asia Minor. If you lived in Rome and you were looking across a map and you looked to the east, well, that was Asia, past Greece. Well, that's what we would call Turkey. We would consider Asia to be farther east from Rome or farther west from where we are. But this was Asia Minor. It was Asia, the churches of Asia, seven churches of Asia. And you see those uh, red squares. Those mark the seven cities. Cities, they were churches named for their city. There was the church at Sardis. There was the church at Ephesus and so on. I just want to pause here and give you an important point that when you're studying the scripture, when you're looking at the plan of God writ large over time and generations, never forget that cities are the key recipients of the revelation of God. It's not to say you can't go to a mountaintop or to a rural town, but cities play an important and outsized role in the revelation of God. In fact, these ancient cities are mostly talked about today. They're known today. They're identified today. Why? Because they had a church in them. They were identified by the history of their church over 21 centuries. The fact that the word of God was revealed to them, like it was revealed to Ur of the Chaldees, and to Sodom and Gomorrah, and to Nineveh, and to Jerusalem, over which Jesus is said to have wept over the city. In the same way, we need to remember that as we pass from this world to the next, as history marches on, how will this city be remembered? When people say Ephesus today, they're not thinking about Diana, who was once its goddess, its patron goddess of paganism. They think about the revelation of God to Ephesus. What will be said about Indianapolis a hundred years from now? Five hundred years from now, a millennia from now? What will be said 21 centuries from now if the Lord tarries about this city? Will it be because the witness and the revelation of God to the people of God who lived in the place was so profound? that it's unforgettable and overwhelms all other of its historic legacy? Oh, we pray so. Well, these seven cities were addressed by Jesus through John for a message, each of them. Now, why these seven? There were many other cities. Well, these were hubs. These were hubs of the gospel. To help you understand that in a contemporary term, look at the next slide. Now, this is a, a slide of Delta Airlines hub cities in the United States. My first job out of grad school I, went, I came out of the law school at the University of Washington in Seattle, which was my hometown. And my first job was with Northwest Airlines, which is now Delta. I'm a fan. I'm still a Delta guy. And I flew to Minneapolis, which was then the headquarters. And I spent months there in an apartment they set up for me so I could learn about the airline, about its culture, its ethos, its way of doing business. And then they sent me back to Seattle where I worked. And what I learned was the airline, and it's not just Delta, every major airline has this, has a city, uh, has a map of hubs like this. Those hubs for Delta are the seed and the culture, the ethos, the values of the airline which flies to hundreds of cities. In fact, you could get on a Delta airline flight, or one that is co-chaired with its airline partners of the Sky Team, and go to almost 500 cities. But the culture is emanating from the hubs. It's so important. The values, the way we do things, the way in which we react, the way in which we are proactive, the way we dream and imagine, manage, all of it is calculated in the hubs and spread from the hubs to the rest 
of the whole airline map. It's the same thing with all kind of knowledge and culture. And in the New Testament, these cities, these seven cities of Asia, were they the hubs? The gospel had been planted there. They were influential crossroads. What was preached in Ephesus would be known throughout the whole of the area in a world before planes, trains, or automobiles. And so Jesus said to John, I want you to write to these seven hubs, these seven cities. I'm reading between the lines here, but I believe it's the design of God because those were strategic trumpets. They were strategic microphones. They were strategic locations where the truth could be proclaimed and multiplied and magnified. Next up, in this picture you'll see those same cities and those seven were each identified specifically, seven cities, and seven churches. They're summarized in the message that Jesus had John write down. In the next slide, you'll see how that unpacks. Perhaps in the next one. There we are, yeah, Ephesus. What Jesus said to John is, you need to write to Ephesus, and, and he introduces himself, Jesus introduces himself to each city in the letter that John writes by, that's kind of transcribed, and, and then he says, here's your challenge, here's your context, here's your problem. You, in Ephesus, you have lost your first love. You have been a people that were so head over heels for me, but now you're kind of, your love is waxing cold. This is a big challenge for you in your context, in the shadow of pagan and secular civilization, which is becoming increasingly hostile. You have lost your first love, and it's not going to bring you to life. In the second letter to the next city at Smyrna, you are suffering and impoverished. Jesus sees, he, he knows what the scenario is, and he knows that the church in, in Smyrna is it's suffering. There was a huge persecution at the time in that particular city, and it was impoverished. It was materially poor, and it was also spiritually uh, on the weak side. Next up, in Pergamum, it was deceived and sexually compromised. Oh, this is so important to remember. He was, Jesus is speaking himself. He said, you know, the city, the city and the church are being deceived, and in your deception, you are sexually compromised. In the next city, which is uh, Thyatira, it's also charged by Jesus with being permissive and sexually compromised. The reason I'm pausing here and saying it's so important is that in the first century of the Christian era, historians have sometimes observed that the single greatest distinguishing mark of the followers of Jesus was, how did people know that they were Christians on the street? They didn't drive cars with fish bumper stickers. They weren't wearing crosses, which was not then yet identified as an emblem of the gospel. How were people identified? What was it about them? And many scholars studied into the context of the time say it was their radical countercultural sexual ethic that was so different from the world around them that distinguished them from the rest. They became recognized as a separate people what we might describe as a holy people because of their sexual ethics. Sometimes we want to push that to the side or we don't feel comfortable talking about it, about our own personal journey of this, this magnificent gift of God and our human sexuality and how it needs to be polished and made holy, but how it also is a marker of our following of Jesus. Jesus calls it out here in these cities. These are my people. These are letters to the churches witnessing to a city. And you cannot lead someone into a holy sexual ethic if you do not yourself experience it first. And it's fundamental to their witness, Jesus says. Next up, in the fifth city, Sardis, it thinks it's alive, but it's actually dead. <laughs> this is the church that imagined itself it's alive, but it's, it's actually dead. People drive by it, they see the side, they hear the music. People come inside and they sing their songs. People dress up and they go out to lunch after. They might even go to Keystone of the Crossing, to the Nordstrom Cafe, which I highly recommend. But the church is dead. I'm not suggesting this one is. I'm just saying in Sardis, there can be the evidence or the, the, the surface appearance of life. But just because there's a crowd, just because the lights are on, doesn't mean it's actually alive. You could be dead. And Jesus warned the church of Sardis next up in Philadelphia. Of all the seven churches, it gets the best review of Jesus. Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia, it says, you have been faithful. You are faithful, and because you are faithful, you will be protected. That doesn't mean to say you'll escape all agony or difficulty or trouble. It doesn't say that life is just going to be easy or you're going to just now follow Jesus and fall into your cruise room at the buffet on your way to heaven. It is to say 
that because of your faithfulness, though the devil will have you, you'll be protected. Though there will be consequences for others, you will be saved from them because of your faithfulness. Which brings us at last to church number seven, Laodicea. Laodicea is lukewarm. And perhaps for all of the seven messages to the seven churches, this is the one that has stuck in the minds of people over the centuries. Jesus says, you know, you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm, and because you're lukewarm, I'm spitting you out of my mouth. Ooh, ouch. And you also are deceived. In your lukewarm state, you're not able to actually see the way things really are. You can't even see yourself in the mirror of your soul, of your mind and your conduct, your thoughts, your, your belief system. You've been deceived. It is this church in Laodicea from which I want to pack more, unpack more deeply. But as we do that, know this. Every one of these churches had a promise. They all, all the messages ended in the next slide with this same verse. Uh, this, this is verse to Laodicea, but throughout the second and third chapters of Revelation, Jesus says the same thing almost verbatim. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. This is a promise. How is that a promise? It sounds like a command. Well, it's both. But the fundamental underlying precept here is Jesus is saying to the churches, no matter what state they are, even Sardis, who imagines itself alive, but stand, I'm still talking to you. I'm supernaturally through the Holy Spirit still speaking to you. I still understand you. I have a plan for you. I have a destiny for you. I have life for you. But you're going to have to make a choice. This is the promise. You can choose to hear the Spirit, to listen carefully, and then choose to understand the Spirit's voice. And it will be a pathway to life and peace, satisfaction and fulfillment. Next up, this is a photograph of today's Laodicea. These seven cities are mostly now just deserted ruins, although some have new modern names and are built on the ruins of the old. Laodicea stands by itself, it's not inhabited. It sits at the convergence of two famous rivers, the Lycus and the Meander. Have you ever heard the English word meandering, someone meanders? You're thinking, just like you're preaching right now, you're meander meandering all over the it comes from this river, which just does that same through this valley. And then it merges up with the Lycus, uh, another major river. And this city was built on a hillside above those rivers. And this picture I chose in part, I was just there uh, last year, because of the mountains. You see the snow in the mountains. Because in a very dry and arid climate, those rivers and that melting snow create a source of water, which is life. Laodicea was constructed at the crossroads of transportation and culture. It became fabulously wealthy. It was so wealthy that it had an em a reputation across the empire. In the year 60 AD, which was before the book of Revelation was likely written, there was such a devastating earthquake that the whole city was practically reduced to rubble. And the Roman Empire, the imperial government in Rome, offered to send a fortune to help build Laodicea in the same way that our central governments would do today. And the city of Laodicea made a reputation for itself throughout the whole empire by saying, no, we don't need your money. We don't need it. We've got plenty of money in the bank. Our banks are still full. I don't know where the gold coins are under those collapsed columns. We'll find them. I mean, I'm reading between them. That's my parlance. But the idea was they refused outside help because they were so self-assured of their own capacity and their own wealth. It was famous for being rich. And when you have money, you also have culture. This was the place where they built the opera houses and the performance venues where the arts and literature flourished. This is a place of economic transaction. This is a place of multiculturalism. This is a place that was famed throughout the empire like some other great Roman cities as being wealthy, erudite, upscale, altogether. I want to go there. That's important because when you hear the message of Jesus to the church, he's speaking into their context. Oh, and there's one other reason Laodicea was very famous. Because in the banks of the mineral springs that are above the rivers, in the hillside upon which the city is built, were minerals in the water, and they were thought to have healing properties, and especially if you took some mud from the water, the mineral water, and put it on your eyes in a world that had no ophthalmology, in a world where sight was so primary, still it is today, but imagine in the ancient world, if you had no capacity to have lenses made for you, or contact lenses, or surgery, or even diagnosis, you just know that you're losing the light because you cannot see. In a world like that, anyone that could offer the hope of restoring your eyesight, even if it be quack medicine, 
would be a thing. And Laodicea was the place in the whole of the Roman Empire where people who could not see dreamed of going, or at least getting some of that healing ointment for their eyes. So it was famous for its wealth, its culture, its self-sufficiency, and it was a place where people came to see. And that explains how Jesus speaks to them. But before we do that, look at this. See this, if you will. These are two portraits. You may have uh, seen them before in print. The one on the left is a famous picture called Head of Christ. The one on the right is called Christ Knocking at Heart's Door. First, the Head of Christ. The portrait artist here is a man named Warner Salmon. He passed away in 1968. He lived in Chicago. He was the, uh, born to two Nordic immigrants, his mother from Sweden, his father from Finland. They uh, had this child, Warner Salmon, in Chicago. He went to the Art Institute of Chicago. He was a deep believer. He was in what was then called the Evangelical Covenant Church. And in 1924, he drew a charcoal sketch of the head of Christ. And then in 1940, he converted that charcoal sketch into that oil painting. That oil painting on the left is considered to be, by most uh, observers, the most recognized image of Jesus in the whole world. Now, we have no photographs of Jesus. We don't actually know what he looked like. But around the world, wherever you see that picture, people believe that's what Jesus looked like. It's had the most influence of any image of Jesus, carved in stone, painted on canvas, or stretched with pastels. It is a phenomenon thought to have been reproduced almost one billion times. Time magazine in the year 2000 said that Warner Salmon, though his name was not well known, was probably the most influential artist of the 20th century because of that painting. But what other people don't know is, where is that painting? Where can I go to actually see the original? It's always in print somewhere. I've been in 73 countries of this world in places where they've never seen a guy like me with blue eyes before and walked into someone's small little house, sometimes with thatched roof, if it had a roof, and seen that on the wall. Well, actually, it's owned by the Church of God with which this church is a part. It's actually resident on the campus of Anderson University. Most people in the world don't know it's there. It's become controversial in recent years because it's a Nordic Jesus, it's a white man's Jesus. And Warner Solomon was of Scandinavian descent and he painted a Jesus that reflected his own community's image, but that's common all around the world. You can have images of Jesus in many different ethnicities and so on, and all legit, because nobody has a picture of him actually. But I'm just saying that famous painting, which is inestimable in its worth, it is like the Mona Lisa. How do you ensure something that has no peer? It's in Anderson, Indiana. And if you want to go see it, you can. It's in a beautiful gallery on the Fine Arts Center on the campus of AU. But Warner Salman in 1940 painted that one. And then on the right, he painted this one uh, called Christ at Heart Store, Knocking at Heart Store. You're thinking, this is the meandering part. No, this is exactly to the text. Because that painting is inspired by the message of Jesus to Laodicea. Because famously in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus is quoted as saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and sup with him and he with me. It's a very evocative and vivid invitation of Jesus to welcome him into your life. And that has spread across the centuries and art. Solomon painted that painting based on that verse. And it also has taken off around the world and is so, so familiar. But its power, and it has legitimate power just as a standalone, that verse does, to see it in its context of the original message to the church at Laodicea will give it more depth. Oh, where can you see that painting? You can see that at Anderson also. Why? Because Anderson University has all of the paintings of Warman's, Warner Solomon, uh, almost all of them. There's one out. It's all there. And that painting of Christ at, at Heart's Door, there it is. That's life size. When you see it on the wall, it's, it's, a, it's a, the size of an ordinary person. And notice how he imagined it. Do you see the light around the door? See, Jesus is knocking on a door, and the light is in the form of a heart. This is Solomon in 1942 trying to capture. He's standing and knocking at heart's door. And notice the door. The door has no handle on it, on the face of it. It can only be opened from the inside. Oh, this is the stuff of genius and inspiration. Jesus can't get into your heart until you open the door. Powerful concept there. But now to the text. These are the words of scripture in the New Living Translation. Jesus tells to John, write this letter to the angel. Angel here, angel actually means, means messenger. So we often think of angels in a supernatural phenomenon, you know, all dazzling and white and so on, and that's a very valid. 
but angel also could refer to a messenger. And this is often thought to be, write this to the pastor, the messenger, the shepherd of the church at Laodicea. Uh, Laodicea. And write this letter and to Laodicea, and this is the message from the one who is the amen. So Jesus is self-describing himself. I am the amen. I want you to know who hear this letter that it's not from the pen of John the Apostle in flesh and blood. It is from the pen of the amen, the supernatural manifestation of God in the person of Christ our Lord. Now, amen is an odd word for us to think of when we think about a name for Jesus. We're accustomed to Jesus be the son of man and the son of God, the savior of the world, the light of the world, the lamb of God, we understand Jesus as the water of life and the bread of life. We see him as the Lord of lords and King of kings, but it's never really occurred to me to call him the Amen. Why does it appear here? Jesus is self-selecting his own name. My grandmother, who was born in 1890 and at the age of 19, came to a very powerful intersection with Jesus. And she passed away at the age of 99 in the year 1989 a very important figure in my life. I, I still have a memory of her whenever I think of the name of God. She would always raise her hand. She'd say, I, I serve the great I am. I am is the name of God disclosed at the burning bush to Moses. When Moses is commanded by God to go down into Egypt and to stare down the Pharaoh, Moses says, well, who am I? Who, who shall I tell him has sent me? And, and God speaking through the burning bush that would not be consumed says, you tell him the I am sent you. The I am is present tense, has no past, has no future, is present, because God exists outside of time. And my grandmother would just say, I serve the great I am. That was her nomenclature. That was her quote. It's from the scripture and fair. Here, though, I've never seen anyone say, I serve the great amen. And yet, this is the name Jesus gave to himself in this text. Why? Because amen is an ancient Semitic word in Hebrew, also in Aramaic, the language of Jesus. And what it literally means is truth. When we say amen at the end of a prayer, what we're acknowledging is we believe it's true. For thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory forever. Amen. That we're saying, yeah, that's true. When someone is in a preaching house and somebody says amen, it means I agree with that. If you've heard the old literature of an amen corner in our own American culture, sometimes people would sit in a corner and over there there'd be the amen people and they'd shout out together amen. It's the Amen corner, it's the people who say, that's truth. Whenever you say amen, you're saying, I believe that because it's true. Jesus said, I am the truth. The same John who quoted in his own gospel, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here quotes Jesus saying in Revelation, I am the amen, the truth. And then underscores it, he, he stretches it out. Jesus is talking, the faithful and true witness the beginning of God's new creation. This is important because we must understand if you want to have the power of heaven in your life, you must be alleged to the truth. It's not an elective truth. And it's not just I'm only true about this and not true about that. It's not that I follow someone who's not famous for telling the truth and tells lies. The devil is the father of lies. And you cannot experience the power of heaven's presence it's destiny, it's influence. You can't be the salt of light in Jesus while dancing with the devil who is the father of lies. And people in our world stage, people in our churches who chase after people on the public stage who are not known for telling the truth are divorcing themselves from the very truth itself. Amen. I know people who have had their whole lives unravel because they felt alleged to a truth that wasn't true and other parts of their life began to crumble too. Jesus is saying to the church at Laodicea, I am the truth. You measure what you hear, you measure what you say, you measure what you do by me, I am the truth. Not some agenda that you would like to see happen. It can never happen if you are divorced from the truth. I'm the faithful and true witness. I am the beginning, that word beginning in the original Greek is to be the source, the catalyst. I am the beginning of the new creation. The truth is the birthing mechanism of the new day. Your life can't be changed. You can't be born again. You cannot have new hope for tomorrow. You can't move past what you have done wrong. You can't move past 
from a culture that's run amok. You can't bring life to your community. You can't actually change the course of events in our country. You can't do anything in your church, in your life. You have no sustainable, lasting impact apart from Christ. And he is the single source and catalyst. You have to clothe yourself in his truth. Breathe his truth like oxygen. Make it the plumb line of your experience. If you want to see a new creation, he who said, behold, I make all things new, quoted already in the service today, that one is not the guardian of the status quo. He's not looking backward, he's looking forward. He is the source of all that's fresh and new, hope and life eternal. Next up, introducing himself, he says to the church at Laodicea, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I, I wish that you were the one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Ooh. I don't want Jesus to spit at all. That's not the Jesus I'm looking at. And I don't want to be in his spit, ejected from his body. In the book of Jonah, the only character in the whole of Scripture to whom Jesus completely com uh, compared, directly compared himself, because he often talked about David or Abraham or Moses and Elijah and so on, but, but he compared himself to Jonah, another prophet from Galilee. And in Jonah chapter 2, it says that the great fish vomited Jonah out. He vomited him out of his disobedience. Having swallowed him at sea, it evokes for me the same imagery. Jesus is spitting. He's expunging you out of my mouth. Whew, I don't want to be there. But that's what happens when you are deceived when you are lukewarm. Notice that he said, I, I, I know all that you do, so let's also just underscore that. Jesus, as he's talking to us, to the church of Laodicea, to the church of the crossing, to Jim Lyon and to you, to James Roberts, whoever we are, he sees everything that we do. There's nothing that is hidden from his eyes. Sometimes that makes me feel very uncomfortable. Not because I'm doing something bad, I'm just not used to being stared at then. But I'm saying Jesus is completely, completely informed by who we are and where we are. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I, I don't need a thing. And, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You are so deceived. You, you, you think this about yourself. You think you've got this down. You think you've got it together. And, and you're completely deceived. You think you're rich, but you're actually poor. You think you're finely clothed, but you're actually naked. You think you can see, but you're blind. You're poor, you're naked, and you're blind. It's not a handsome combination. Next up. I want to advise you, Jesus says, to buy gold for me. Gold always in scripture. That thing that has been refined by the fire, that can be pure. I want you to find purity from me. Gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. You will be rich when you are pure, when you are holy. Also buy white garments for me so that you will not be ashamed in your nakedness, an ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. You know, I told you I came from Seattle and I was so excited when you got a Nordstrom store. My mother was a Nordstrom junkie in Seattle. I mean, I grew up in a Nordstrom store. And by that, I mean, she, my mother went to Nordstrom just to hear them play the piano. All the stores used to have pianos. And she, she didn't buy anything. She just walked through and get a coffee and listen, play the piano. When I was 18 years old, my mother arranged for me to have a personal shopper at Nordstrom's. What? That's what I said, too. And she said, I've arranged for you. This woman's name was Donna. She ultimately retired, and I got a younger guy, which uh, he, they were both good, but I was more comfortable with Paul, the second guy. Anyway, downtown Seattle, 4th and Pine, it's, it's the flagship Nordstrom store. And every year my birthday, which is in August, which is the Nordstrom anniversary sale, they only have a couple sales a year, and the anniversary sale always holds my birthday, my mother would call up my personal shopper and say, I'm writing a check, I'm putting it in the bank at Nordstrom's, and you're going to see my son, and I want you to help him dress right. And I went down there and met Paul Murphy, who uh, I had for years as my personal shopper, and he, they had private dressing rooms, and I'd have an appointment, I'd go down there, and he kept track of everything I purchased every year on my mother's dime. My, mom, my dad was in it too, but he wasn't quite so passionate about it. And, oh, I see you bought uh, some gray slacks and a blue navy blazer and a red striped tie. Uh, you know, you need a blue shirt this year, and maybe you need some brown loafers, or maybe you need some chinos, or maybe you need 
these jeans or whatever it was. He had a complete inventory over the years of everything I had in my closet. And then he'd match it. And then in that room, he'd bring them out and lay them out. And I'd try them on. And then I would make my choices. Do you know that that started when I was 18 years old? I'm 72. And my mother lived to be 97. She passed away in 2019. And when she was 95, I said, Mom, enough already. Because she was flying me to Seattle to the personal shopper every August. I want the trip, but I don't need the shopper. You're an old lady. You're a widow. It's enough. What I'm saying is the reason that it was important to her and what I learned to appreciate about it was when the personal shopper would choose the clothes, he would also see that they fit perfectly in a way that I might not always be conscious. He made sure that they fit perfectly. I'm telling you the story, not meandering, because Jesus said, I want you to buy from me white linens because you are naked. You need clothes that fit you. And in Revelation 19, 8, the same imagery is reintroduced by Jesus where we are told that the white linens of Jesus will clothe us perfectly and bear witness to our good deeds. It's the clothing, the white linen represents the good deeds that cover our failing nakedness because of our faith in Christ. Ephesians 2.10, you are God's masterpiece, created new in Christ Jesus. You have been created new in Christ Jesus for the purpose of what? Many of us think, so I can learn new songs, so I can go to a discipleship class, so that I can be faithful, so that I can go to a conference, so that I can just be esteemed in my community. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that people think they have been made new in Christ. But here's what the Bible says. This is what God says. You have been made new in Christ Jesus, his masterpiece for the purpose of good works, good deeds. What ones are those? The ones that were planned for you long ago beforehand. God, before you were even formed, imagined you and gave you a destiny to do certain good works. He knows what needs to happen. He knows you need to do them. You were created for those purposes. Put on the white linen. Discover the call of God and do something good to change the course of history. Your own, those you love, your community, the city. It's not small talk, it's big ambition and it brings life. Buy from me the white linen that has been designed and custom tailor fit for you. You don't need a personal shopper, you have Jesus Christ the Lord. And then I want to help you see because when you see yourself destined for those good deeds. When you see yourself, no matter how many pieces of china you've broken against the floor in the wreck of your life, no matter how many mistakes you've made, things you don't want to remember, no matter what, when you put on those white clothes, then you can see in the mirror who you are in a way that the ointment you're buying from this world will never disclose to you next up. I correct and discipline everyone I love to be diligent and to turn from your indifference so be, be diligent. Don't take this lightly. Don't just think, well, this is just talk. This is just a few minutes to fill the Sunday morning. This is Jesus speaking to all of us and to you. And if you ignore it, he will discipline you, not because he's punishing you, but because he loves you. Next. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. The beautiful portrait of Jesus. He painted himself that mere human hands can't fully capture, even though they be worn as Solomon's. Of Jesus' thirst for your company, intimacy with you, to hang out with you, to talk with you in a world that's turned upside down, in a world that we cannot predict, in a world where all the surveys say people are uncertain about the future, that we're somehow on the wrong track, in a world of volcanic eruptions and tornadoes and earthquakes, in a world of economic distress and political tomfoolery and lies on the stage broadcasted as truth. Not to worry. Jesus wants to spend time with you so that you can sort it all out and have hope. John Mark Comer famous pastor from Portland, Oregon, now left his local church there to write books, but a very, really brilliant guy with whom we've become acquainted in the Church of God, at his church in Portland uh, called Bridgetown. But his, his model of ministry, discipleship, is captured in three phrases that once I heard them, I cannot escape. Here's how you follow Jesus. You, you be with Jesus. You spend time with Jesus. 
you are intentional about sitting down at the table with Jesus. How do you do that? You pray, you read the scripture, you just tune out everything else, you just turn it off for a moment. You've got to focus. Be with Jesus. But if you be with Jesus, you will become like Jesus because you will reflect the company you keep. And if that company is on phone, you'll reflect it. If that company is in your heart with Jesus, you'll reflect it. Be with Jesus. Become like Jesus. And what happens when you become like Jesus? You do what Jesus did. Of course. What am I supposed to do? What did Jesus do? How do I know what he did? What's he called me to do? Well, if I'm spending time with him, if I'm becoming like him, if I'm praying daily, and this is in my, my prayer journal every day now, Lord, transform my mind, renew it to make it like the mind of Christ so that I can do what Jesus did. There's the key to life. Those who are victorious will sit with me. Those who do this will sit with me and spend time with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. My wife said to me just this last week, one evening when we were retiring for bed, and she was talking on about our grandson, Simon O'Connor Lyon, who turned three this week, and I was on my phone, laying on my bed, reading the news. She was talking for quite some time, and she said, Jim, are you listening? Sweet of her to say so, so kindly, as she always does. Okay, most of the time. And I was conscious. I can hear the sound of her voice. I know that there is sound all around me. I know that she loves me. I know that she has things to share with me. I know all of that, but I was not making the choice to listen. This is the same with the Holy Spirit. He's in this house right now. He is speaking to you. He's whispering. I want to dine with you. I want to enjoy your company. I want to give you some new clothes. I want to hand you some gold that you can take as a treasure to this world and the world beyond. I want you to see the truth so you can be free because the truth will set you free. But I'm whispering to you because you're listening to all the kinds of voices. You're, you're listening to all the kinds of sourcing. You're, you're preoccupied with other things. Let me, who made you, imagined you, and made good works for you, be in your company. Which brings us back to Jesus at heart's door. There is at the heart some would say it's kind of dated imagery, but it still resonates, it's still clear. You can't look at it without understanding what is the truth of the text. And remember, only you can open your heart's door. You're the only one. Now, this image of Warren Solomon from 1942 actually was based on a custom in the 19th century. Uh, an English artist named William Holman Hunt, who painted a picture of Jesus knocking on a door, inspired by the same verse, but it was kind of dark. And Solomon wanted to bring it into the light. And that has inspired now, in many genres, in many faith traditions, the same imagery. This is an orthodox icon reproduced after Solomon's painting in an orthodox artistic style of the same message. It doesn't matter what your background is. The truth is still the same. Next up. This is a more contemporary uh, image where the same idea of a heart at the door has been captured almost as if in a greeting card. But however you see it, however you interpret it, or however you expose yourself to it, the message is the same. Jesus is knocking on the door right now. And not just your door. He's knocking on the door of Indianapolis. How will anyone in the Circle City hear the knock if we ourselves have not opened the door? Before you return to your home today, do not forget the word of Jesus to the church in Laodicea. And no, it's a word for us too. And while he may challenge you and tell you something about yourself that is not pleasing to hear, remember the truth always heals, even when it's hard to bear. And it's never delivered by Jesus without the redemptive promise of, I want to make it right for you. Pray with me. Father, we're so thankful today for the voice of Jesus echoing across time and in the present moment. 
for the faithful witness of John who was dazzled that Lord's day so long ago at Patmos and who was obedient to take the words and put them on the paper. For your Holy Spirit that still is striving within us and made all of us, Lord, all of us, because we were here today on this Lord's day, may we move closer to your will and way for having been here now with you. In Jesus' name.